<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to philoseminar.org. Sorry about those technical difficulties, but we're here now. The current theme is birth death identifiability again, and this is the last talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speaker is Dr. John Rhodes. John received his PhD from MIT in number theory, but through a curriculum development project was later exposed to phylogenetics. He began working in the area as a sideline about 20 years ago, but it soon took over his research program. Much of this research is focused on questions of model identifiability. That is, when is phylogenetic inference even theoretically possible? More recently, this has incorporated the coalescent and networks. Welcome, John, and thank you for participating. Thanks, Eric, and thanks for organizing the seminar, and uh, I appreciate also the previous speakers in this series. I found it fairly informative. Okay, so uh, my topic today is on identifiability of multi-type speciation models, and I'm going to give a positive result on that. Um, but I'm going to um, first mention I had two collaborators in this project, Dakota Dragomir, who was a truly excellent master's student, and Elizabeth Allman, both at UAF. The outline of my talk is I'm gonna begin sort of with the basics of diversification models. This may be too basic for some of you, but I think it's it still sets the stage well. Uh, then talk about what we mean by identifiability because there's a particular quirk in the meaning of it in the setting for the models that, that we're interested in. Uh, mention what the previous identifiability results are and maybe give you some pointers on how you might think in the future about whether a model is likely to be identifiable and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that had been made with the, the birth death models in the past. Um, then I'll go state carefully what our main result is, uh, give you an idea of the, the key uh, points behind the proof, and then make some final comments. And as I go through this, while this is not a talk about inference, I'm going to be referring to inference quite a bit. And I just decided to do it in the maximum likelihood setting it's not that I'm opposed to Bayesianism. It's just simpler to talk about in, in one setting and not in both. Okay. All right, so what are the diversification models? So these are models that really just assign a probability to any rooted metric tree. Um, they're typically used for two things. And in some of the applications, these two things get sort of confounded in a way that I don't think is, is really a good way of thinking about them. So one use is for inferring speciation and extinction rates. So given a tree, what can we say about how speciation or extinction varied over time? And the other is for investigating whether there are certain uh, traits that might correlate uh, with those changes in rates. Um, but I, I think it's best to think of those as distinct issues. And uh, one slightly odd thing in the uh, application of these models is that almost all of the time, the data that people have in mind is a single tree. Um, just to point out how weird this is, it's like if you were trying to understand the probability of heads on uh, flipping a coin and your data consists of one coin toss, uh, that's not much data. And you, you can argue, well, the trees could be big, there could be lots of branches, maybe there is a lot of information in that tree, but it is an issue that has to be dealt with. Um, in particular, if there is a lot of information, how do you get it out? So the data set here, um, and I realize this is often not true data because the tree itself has to be inferred. So I've got data in quotes, is one tree, and then we might have some trait information uh, from the extant species, uh, but that's just gonna be at the leaves. Okay, so the all these models have sort of a mechanistic framework where we start with a single node, which you can think of as the root of a tree, and an edge grows out of it over time. And so maybe four units of time in the past, we started with this node, and as one unit passed, this edge grew, and then through some random process, it's speciated. We have some rate at which speciation occurs, and when it speciates, that gives me two lineages now, which continue to grow. And again, through this random process here, I got an extinction at that point, okay? Um, so that edge just stopped growing, but the other one kept growing. Then a little bit more time passes, and the one that could continue to grow went through what looks like a rapid burst of uh, speciation here, splitting up into a lot of different lineages. 
Um, but then some of those lineages also have already gone extinct. You can see this one right here has stopped growing. Uh, it's not as long as the others, and here's one as well. And then another unit of time passes and we get an even larger tree. Uh, but then once we get to the present, time zero, uh, another thing goes on, which is all of the branches that didn't make it to the present are pruned from the tree. So for instance, in this whole clade over here, there were only two branches that made it to the present. So that's all you see here is these two coming off of this one thing. Everything else has been lost. And so that's a serious loss of information. You know, it's unavoidable. We don't generally have information about extinct species, but it's a key component of the model. Um, so the model parameters are going to be some speciation or birth rates. We can call them either one. They're births of lineages. Lambda, always lambda for speciation. And some extinction or death rates, mu, and then perhaps others. And I'll be more specific about those uh, in a minute. Okay. These models split into two basic frameworks. And there's certainly other versions that combine these. But I think it's best to, to stick with the simpler ones. So the first basic framework is that lambda and mu might be time dependent. So these rates apply to every lineage in the tree at a particular time. All the lineages are speciating and mutating at exactly the same rate. And this models any factor that you might think affects speciation and extinction um, that is in extrinsic to every lineage. So it's like an environmental factor. Um, that, that might cause speciation to be more likely or less likely, and similarly for extinction. And these are the models you see used in birth death skyline plots in uh, Beast, and the talk by Luca and Pinnell uh, about a year and a half ago in this seminar, and the one two talks ago by uh, Terhorst, all were about these kinds of models. The type I'm more interested in in this talk is the trait dependent rates, where each lineage at any given time has one of K trait types. And depending on the type, we have specific speciation and extinction rates. So if I know the lineage is type two, then there will be type two speciation rate and type two extinction rate. But then there's a, an additional thing going on where the type may switch. I may type uh, switch from say type two to type one with a certain third rate here, Sij. Um, and so that's what where the, the change over time comes from, not from something that I have put into the speciation and extinction rate by, but by something that is changing the type. Um, and these models really have rather different features. And you should think of them as they're modeling things that are intrinsic to a particular lineage. Um, that lineage, it might be, say, body size. And I might have two types, big and small. And big bodied things speciate at one rate, and small bodied ones speciate at a different rate. But as uh, evolution occurs, a big bodied uh, organism may uh, go through some sort of mutations and end up as a small bodied one. But you know, body size is one example. Uh, behavior could be one, whether a particular gene variant is expressed. And the one I like the best is we don't know what those factors are. There are unknown factors. We are assuming there are K of them. And uh, the issue of, of what they actually are is maybe a separate one from understanding whether they exist. And these models uh, are all the ones that are usually called something with an SSE behind it, BISI and all of its descendants. Um, these were the ones that were talked about in the last talk in this uh, series. And they're the ones that I'm going to be uh, focusing on a little bit more too. OK, so what does identifiability mean? So if we go back a little bit to sort of uh, the general statistical theory, if you have some model and you're going to use some inference method, so this may be maximum likelihood, uh, you want that combination to have what's called statistical consistency, which says if we had data that came out of the model with some parameter p, um, then we could get p back by our inference method as accurately as we wanted, provided we have enough data. This is you know, a fairly weak condition in the sense of if you didn't have it, then you would be saying, well, if I got more data, I couldn't do a better job. Then you know, that's not the usual framework people want to be in. Um, but 
to think about this a little bit more informally, I, it's if we have enough data, so you could imagine having infinite amounts of data, as much as you want. And when I say the data is perfect, I mean, it actually came from whatever model I'm assuming. So there's no noise, there's no slight misspecification of the model. But if I was in this perfect world where I had as much data as I wanted, and I really got the model exactly right, then I could somehow out of that get the truth. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost a basic assumption we make when we do uh, any sort of statistical inference. But for this to be possible, the model alone has to have a property that almost looks the same. It's called identifiability or identifiability of parameters. Um, and that's that the value of the parameter is determined by the probability distribution arising from the model. But what do I mean by this? Because this is getting a little math jargony. The probability distribution arising from the model is really just the math description of having infinite amounts of perfect data. If I had as much data as I wanted and it really all came from the bot, the model, then that would be, mean that I had enough information to determine the truth. So I'm not going to actually do the inference. The inference method is a separate issue that comes into statistical consistency, but it means there's enough information in it for me to be able to do the inference by some means that may still be hard to come up with. Okay, and then Standard statistical theorems, and I've given one example of this, it's often the most quoted one, say things like, if your model has identifiable parameters and you do maximum likelihood, then you get statistical consistency. So if the model is such that it's possible to get the parameters out, there's enough information in them, and you use this procedure to get at that information, then the more data you have, the more accurate an answer you'll get. Um, and this is often used as sort of the justification for why we like maximum likelihood. And it's also used as a justification for why we need to focus on identifiability of parameters. But these theorems actually uh, don't tell us quite what we want in, uh, in the phylogenetic setting here, because the data set for these theorems generally means if you have many independent identically distributed, so IID samples, coming from your model, then you will have statistical consistency. And this is a problem because in this setting, this means that if we had many trees with the same model parameters, then we could infer the, the uh, parameters. But in fact, when we apply these diversification models, we don't have many trees. We've got one tree. Okay, And so there's a, a real potential problem here. Okay, so is a sample of one tree a problem? So first of all, not always, okay? If you had only one trait type, so, and I include in that the time-dependent models because everything is behaving exactly the same way, it turns out it's not a problem because the growing tips of the tree behave completely independently of each other. And so you can teach, uh, treat that growing part of the tree as a bunch of independent samples. But if you go up to the multi-type models, it's not really clear whether having one tree is a problem or not, because different parts of the tree are definitely not independent of one another. What happens when a lineage speciates or goes extinct depends on the trait type. But that trait type was inherited from the previous part of the tree. So it depends on the, the, the previous history of the tree, and that history is shared. And so we don't have any independent samples anywhere in the tree. Um, and so standard consistency theorems like the one I just stated actually don't even apply. I'm not going to go down that road. What I want to say first is we need a different notion of identifiability than the standard one. And that's not, can you get the information uh, on parameters from a probability distribution, but it's, can you get the information on the parameters from looking at a single tree that is arbitrarily large? Okay, so we have to do something to, to make us feel like we're getting more data. That's what I mean by arbitrarily large. The, the depth of the tree is going to get bigger and bigger, but is there a way to extract information on the parameters from that situation with one tree? 
And that's what I'll be talking about the rest of the time. Okay, so a previous result. Um, this goes back to the, the, the early papers on birth death models from the 1990s, which had Harvey, Nee, and May, and various other people and convolutions of those names in different orders on them. Um, they considered sort of an extension of the Yule model where you had one type, you had a constant speciation rate and a constant uh, extinction rate. Okay, so this, this falls under both time dependent and the multi-type setting. Multi-type by just saying there's one type, time dependent by saying the time dependent functions are just constants. So it's sort of the birth of all of these. And these models have a feature that if I had a tree like this, I can actually summarize any of the information in that tree uh, for this model by looking at a lineage is through time plot. So I've plotted that here for this particular tree. Uh, notice it's on a log scale here. So this is the, the, this is the value of n, but they're logarithmically spaced. And so we see we start off with one lineage, then it splits to two lineages, then shortly after it's three lineages, and then very rapidly it goes from three to four and so on, and then so on down the line. And this lineages through time plot captures the information in this tree, all the information that's in that tree. The topology tells you nothing uh, for a very special reason. It's because we have all the branches behaving exactly the same way, because we have one type. Okay, so whether they're con the, the rates are constant or even if they're time dependent, as long as there's only one rate lambda and one rate mu, because the, the lineages will be IID, this tree topology tells me nothing more than what the lineages through time function is. This is not true for the trait dependent uh, models, though, in that uh, you already saw in the last talk, they gave an, an, a very nice example of moving some branches around on a tree so that the uh, lineages through time plot didn't change, but likelihood values did change, sort of showing that, that, that the, a trait dependent model does have more information in it. It uses information in a different way. Okay, but let's think about identifiability of that. It, it's actually pretty easy to see. Um, so one of the things you notice about the plot is this early plot is more or less linear, and then there's a little upturn there, okay, at the very end. And um, it turns out that the slope through this middle section is basically lambda minus mu. Okay, it varies around that, but it gets closer and closer to that straight line with slope lambda minus mu, um, which makes sense because this is speciation minus extinction. And in this part of the tree at these times, I'm seeing the full effect of, of extinctions. And so I know I've got growth in number of lineages from lambda and I've got loss of lineages from mu. So this is completely reasonable. Um, there isn't a lot of information in this early part of the tree because there's just so few lineages. You're seeing a lot of stochastic variation before it settles down because I have many, many independent lineages that are all behaving according to the same process. And then at the very end, you see another sort of behavior where the slope is definitely changing and it's getting closer and closer to just the speciation rate. That also makes sense because if you're near the tips of the tree, we've recorded the tree up to that time. And when we uh, do the pruning of extinct lineages, the lineages that just appeared don't have time to go extinct. So what we're seeing, especially as you get really close to the tips, is just the effect of speciation. And that's resp responsible for that, that slope lambda. So to prove that you can uh, identify lambda and mu from a single tree in this situation isn't too hard because you just have to prove that these facts are correct, that you really do get uh, closer and closer to slope lambda minus mu. So that means you can identify lambda minus mu. You really do get closer and closer to slope lambda. So that means you can get lambda. And with the two of those, you can get mu. Okay. But this is actually assuming the tree depth is getting bigger and bigger because that's what I need to get more and more lineages, which in this case are basically independent samples of the process. 
Okay, so what about the more general setting that we've been hearing about? So for time-dependent rates, uh, from the, the great paper of Luca and Pinnell, we know that lambda of t and mu of t are not identifiable with lots of really wonderful um, exposition on that so that you can see how bad the problem is. And that's a result that holds even if you had many independent trees. Okay, it doesn't depend on just having one of them. Uh, we heard in the last talk that this actually was, um, there's a, a simpler version of this, a lot of special cases from back in 1995 that's also, you know, if we had all been paying more attention, maybe had been, uh, would have warned us not to go down this route of time dependent lambda and muse. Um, but I want to point out one even earlier paper in, in, uh, by the, the sort of founders of this area in 1994, in their very first analysis of these uh, models with constant lambda and mu, they showed that a constant lambda and mu give you exactly the same lineages through time plot as a time particular time varying lambda and a mu being zero. Okay, so birth and death at constant rates is equivalent to time varying speciation and no extinction. And there is no way to tell those apart uh, in uh, this birth death uh, model framework. Um, so that is in fact a case of non-identifiability which you can get out of if you insist that lambda and mu be constants, but if you allow lambda and mu to be potentially time varying, we already know the model wasn't identifiable. Now, it would have been great if they had highlighted that as a non-identifiability issue. They didn't. I understand why they didn't. They were just really introducing the models and exploring them, but uh, you know, it would have been great if we had all noticed sooner. Um, and then on the positive end, the two talks, uh, the Two talks ago, we heard about uh, the results of Legrede and Terhorst uh, that show that you can recover identifiability by putting restrictions on lambda and mu. Uh, they have two results. The first one was if this, that lambda and mu are piecewise constant, and then they extended it to piecewise polynomial. Okay. Um, so when I step back and think about why this model is problematic, the original model, um, two things come to mind to me. And the first one is that these are completely general functions, no restriction whatsoever. And to specify a general function, you're specifying an infinite amount of information, its value at every single value of t. Uh, so more formally, a statistician would say that we have an infinite dimensional parameter space, or they might say, well, now we're in a non-parametric setting because we are, have no assumptions about the nature of these functions other maybe than that they're continuous, but that's non-parametric statistics. And often in that situation, identifiability fails. Okay, not always, but often. The other thing that stands out at me about this is that we actually have some information that's hidden from the original tree production by the pruning process. And hiding things like that is also something that often leads to non-identifiability, not always. But in this model, the original model, we have two bad things, infinite dimensionality and hidden uh, information are two potentially bad things. And it's not surprising in retrospect that two bad things is super bad. And uh, we learned from Luca and Pinnell that in fact was the case. Um, but one way of thinking about the Legrede and Terhorst uh, results is by restricting to piecewise constant or polynomial submodels they are getting out of the non-parametric setting and introducing a certain structure to those functions so that it's now a parametric question. Um, and uh, what that does is it converts us from an infinite dimensional parameter space to a finite dimensional one. We still have hidden variable, hidden information, but we got rid of one of the bad problems and we recover uh, identifiability. Um, the other thing you might think about doing, though this doesn't have any practical value, is to think about what would happen if we didn't do the pruning, we didn't hide that information. In that setting, it's not hard to see that you can identify both lambda and mu because you identify mu first, because you have complete information about all of the uh, extinctions, and then 
you can use some of the results of, of uh, Luca and Pinnell to say, if I know mu, I can get lambda back. Um, so if either one of these didn't hold, we wouldn't have be in this, this non-identifiable situation, but unfortunately they did both hold. Okay, trait dependent rates, the ones I'm most interested in. Okay, so um, the only result I've seen in the literature uh, deals with a pure birth model, which I'm also going to be dealing with. So there's no extinction allowed. And then, so we have only speciation rates and then switching rates. And uh, there's a result that proved that those were, that was, situation was identifiable, provided the trait types are observed at the leaves, which is often the assumption when people are, say, applying BISI, but also near the leaves. And what near meant was the nodes parental to the leaves. Okay. Um, however, in practice, we never have that information. So this, this is a, a, a nice mathematical result. It's a step forward, but it doesn't solve the problem because types are, in every application I've ever seen, hidden at all the internal nodes. And now at the leaves for these trait dependent models, the, the missy one, they may be hidden at the leaves, so there's no observation there. Hissy, they're partially observed, and then the older ones, they're observed. Um, and, and these observations also are, again, making this assumption that the what we say is the observed trait is really the one that was modeled, and we never really know that. Okay, But the good thing about these models is the trait dependent ones have finite dimensional parameter spaces as well as hidden information. So this is good for identifiability. This can be bad, but at least we're not in the worst possible situation. Okay. So now the main result. Um, so I'm gonna consider a trait dependent multi-type pure birth model. So I'm gonna have any number of traits K, with K being finite. Um, the pure birth means there's no extinction, at least for now. We can talk about extinctions later. And the type uh, is hidden everywhere. So this is like the Missy model that appeared in the last talk. So no observations of type even at the leaves. But the result's going to apply even for these other SSE models um, because if you have that trait information, it doesn't hurt. Uh, in terms of identifying the parameters. It's just the result is saying it's not really necessary. So the result then is going to apply to the pure birth submodels of all of these, Bissy, Musi, Hissy, Bissy, so on. Um, but I want to be really clear, it does not apply to another model, Quasi, which dealt with the hidden variable, the trait being a uh, real number, so a continuum of trait types. That is not a finite number of traits, and it doesn't fall into the framework of our uh, arguments at all. And in fact, I have uh, no idea, but I would perhaps be skeptical on this one, that it would be identifiable. Um, people have asked me about similar models with a continuous hidden variable, and uh, there are basically no known results on, on whether they're identifiable or not. Okay, so uh, to, to look at a specific example, if we have K trait types, I'd like you to think about just having two and we'll call them fast and slow speciating types. I'm gonna have K squared parameters, so that'll only be four here. So two speciation rates and two switching from one to two and two to one. And I've got a, a sort of running simulation I'm gonna use uh, as I go through the next slides. So K is two, two types. Switching rates are not the same. They could be uh, black it speciates at a rate of 0.1, so that's my slow type, and red speciates at a rate of 0.5, that's my fast speciating type. And in the simulation, you see a number of interesting things. So for instance, here on this edge, we switched from uh, type one to type two, and then back to type one without ever undergoing a speciation, okay? And you will see there are other places where um, I think this one down here, um, it actually turned black right before we got to that node. So even though it looks like maybe this was a rapid speciation, 
this speciation actually occurred very quickly after we went into the slow speciation state. So where branches are short or long doesn't absolutely correlate with the color, though if I have it colored there, I think you can sort of say, yeah, red looks like it's speciating more than black. Okay, but all the type information is hidden, so this is my data, that tree. Um, and I think when you look at that, it's not so clear that there are um, two different speciation rates. And it's also really not clear how you're going to get the information out that there could be two. So I, I'll, I'll start by stating the theorem, and I'm going to go through its statement and interpreting it for a bit, little bit before I mention any of the mathematical arguments uh, that'll be at the end. But I want to pause for a second. I'm not getting any feedback. Eric, are you still there? Still here. This is like really beautiful, clear talk. So okay, yeah, great. Question so far. Yeah. Uh, you, usually, you just interrupt people, which I think is great. But um, you know, I, I don't actually see you now with because I'm on full screen. So thanks. Okay. So here's what the theorem says. And in the first version of reading this theorem, I'm going to skip skip that first word. It says parameters of the K-type pure birth model are identifiable from a distribution derived from a single tree. So we can work with just one tree as the tree depth goes to infinity. So I have to have informally, this can say, this is sort of saying, if your tree is really, really big, then there is enough information to get out the parameters that you like. Okay. Um, and so it sort of justifies using these models, at least in the pure birth form. But there is this word generic here, and that's got a technical math uh, interpretation, uh, which doesn't mean, well, you can give it, maybe you can find a way to make it mean something like boring or cheap or something like that. But it means basically generic parameters are most of the parameters. So most of the time, you will have identifiability. But there are cases where identifiability fails, and these are unavoidable, okay? And um, I will, will give in detail what this generic word means on the next slide for one particular choice of K. Okay, so what does generic mean? So it means we're gonna exclude some cases that might potentially be problematic, okay? And, and I'll go through what we exclude. So regardless of what K is, I have to put these three conditions in here. So what do they mean? So lambda is greater than zero. That's just saying every type, type has to have the possibility of speciating. Okay, that's no big surprise because if a type couldn't speciate, you know, then what's going to happen? I go into that type and unless I switch out of that type, I never see any Thing about uh, a further speciation, I would just have a branch that continued on forever. And so there's going to be very little information about a type where speciation rate was zero. So I'm going to just throw that case out. Okay. This one over here means I have to be able to switch from any type to any other type directly. Okay. This type, this switching rate could be really low. If I had five types and they all say were like different body sizes, it may be very unlikely that I'm going to switch from body size really small to body size really large, but I have to allow for that potentially to happen by making SIJ at least something that's tiny but not zero. Okay, I don't think people would find either of these two objectionable, and I'm going to try to convince you this one is not objectionable either, because what is that saying? It's saying if lambda i were lambda j, then I would have two types that speciated at exactly the same rate. So they were behaving exactly the same way. And how could I possibly tell those two apart? They're going to be better off thought of as lumped together into one, one uh, type. And so none of these are, are ones that I think any reasonable person would find the least bit objectionable. But there's a different, a, di a, a additional condition that I have some polynomial I'm going to write down that involves all of these. And when I plug in the numbers that are those rates, it has to give me something other than zero. Okay. And this polynomial is a little hard to, to understand. And so I've written it down explicitly in the case that K is equal to three. And there it is. Okay. 
not a polynomial anybody other than a mathematician might like. Okay, it is completely well as far as I have been able to do, completely opaque to any interpretation directly. If you ask about this later, I can give you a little bit more information on that. Um, but it is, it is just this polynomial that comes out of the proof, and it really matters, okay? So what I have to convince you to say that um, this condition that the parameters have to be generic is okay and not something you shouldn't worry about is you know, what are the parameters? There's some numbers that are, say, let's hope uh, if, if we got the model right, determined by nature. And so I have to ask myself, if nature picked a bunch of lambdas and s's, would it pick ones that made this polynomial give me exactly zero? It doesn't seem likely that if it were zero, that would be saying there's some very special relationship between the parameters that make it zero. And the word generic really means there's not a special relationship. These parameters are not special in any way. And in particular, they're not special in this particular way, that that would be equal to zero. I'm going to give you two, two more detailed ways of thinking about that. But before I do that, I want to say this generic identifiability condition is really common among models that have hidden variables. And we have all information on the trait types hidden. So we are forced to deal with hidden variables. But some of the models that you should have perhaps heard of that have hidden variables like this built into them and also have this generic identifiability condition, they're not identifiable completely. They're just generically identifiable, include hidden Markov models. And these are heavily used for everything from speech recognition to bioinformatics. They're, they're really just used all over the place. And people don't find them problematic because those special parameters that would, would cause identifiability to fail just tend not to turn up. Uh, latent class models are a bunch of models that are used in uh, economics, uh, econometrics, and, and, uh, and also psychology. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They also have this feature and people still find these models extremely useful. More modern network affiliation models have hidden variables as well. All of them, the best you can get is generic identifiability, but that has not stopped anybody from using them. Okay, so back to the, that polynomial. So here's, here's a good geometric way of viewing it. So if I had two parameters, think of this rectangle as being my parameter space. So maybe the, the parameter on the horizontal axis can vary from 0 to 2, and the one on the vertical axis can vary from 0 to 1. And I have some polynomial that these have to, if I plug up the parameters into them, it has to not give me 0. So what I've done is plotted here for some polynomial that I made up the set of points in this space where that polynomial does give me zero. So the blue ones are where the polynomial would be zero and everything else is where it's not zero. And so that result on the previous page says, I would have identifiability if my parameters were chosen in any of the white region in this rectangle. I just can't choose them. Well, I, they just can't be coming from the blue region. I shouldn't say we get to choose the parameters. They are what they are, right? But but this, I think, is a good geometric illustration of it is highly unlikely that uh, the parameters are actually going to lie on this special curve here. Now, even for the two-state example I was running, we had four parameters. So the analogous picture here would have been a four-dimensional, uh, let's say, cube but a four-dimensional one, not three-dimensional. And the bad points, the ones where that polynomial was zero, would have been some three-dimensional surface inside that thing. Um, and so within a four-dimensional space, you rule out some three-dimensional thing. That's not ruling out much. Okay. And in fact, uh, one good sort of more formal uh, definition of, of generic identifiability is that the set on which identifiability fails has lower dimension than the parameter space. In this picture, the parameter space was two-dimensional, and where identifiability failed was just this one-dimensional curve inside there. OK, 
Okay. And then my favorite way of thinking about generic identifiability is the sort of probabilistic one, which is if somebody out there, nature or God or whoever, chooses the parameters for this process and they do it at random, they're going to pick ones where you have identifiability. They might throw a dart at this picture. And if I throw a dart at that picture, no matter how good my aim is, it's highly unlikely I'm going to end up exactly on that blue curve. We're going to end up somewhere in a white region. And so in that sense, choosing the parameters randomly, I will get identifiable ones. And in fact, for a generic identifiability result, if you believe the parameters are not chosen by some sort of random process, then you can go down the road of nature is malevolent. They're picking the parameters so that my model will, will not be identifiable. But you have to almost really think there is some deep reason why the parameters would appear on that curve if they do. Okay. Any questions on that before I go on? Totally okay. clear. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the ideas behind the proof. So this will be a little bit more technical, but I'll try not to, to, to go into too much depth. So we, because we have this lack of independence between lineages, working with the lineages through time plot is, is hopeless. It doesn't contain the information that the tree does. So forget about the lineages through time plot. What I'm going to do is think about a single tree of depth T. So I, this is my running example, same one you saw before. And I'm going to draw a line here at T over 2. And I'm going to just ignore everything that happens in these earlier times for two reasons. So even, even in the, the basic uh, single rate uh, version, we saw there was a lot of noise in what happens there. Um, but also another reason is what happens here is biased toward what the state was at the root, because it may take a while for that state to change. And so any information about speciation and extinction that's in this part of the tree is going to tell me really more about one possible type than the other. So I'm just going to ignore it. Um, I'm not saying you should do that for data analysis. I'm saying for this proof, I'm going to ignore it. Um, and so I'm going to focus on this, this lower half of the tree. And in fact, what I'm going to do is look at this line at T over 2 and where it crosses these lineages. And every time it crosses a lineage, I'm going to look for three branches below there. So the first one goes from that line to the first node. And then the other two branches go from that node to its children. Okay. So I, I've just color-coded these three, that's going to be the information that I'm going to look at, the length of those branches. I go over, follow the line down, here's another one, and I again get three branches. I follow it down, well, here's a lineage and nothing is marked, so why didn't I mark it? Because if I follow it down to the right, I never even get to another node, another place where speciation has occurred. And so that process of speciation there was sort of never completed, and I'm going to throw it out as well. Same here, though, here, if I go down, I do get a speciation event. And if I go to the right, I get another speciation event. But if I go to the left, well, I, that didn't speciate. So again, this edge is still going to be growing. I don't know when it's going to speciate. I'm just going to throw it out. Um, OK, that one. And here I got finally a third one. And then this one gives me no information as well. So what I'm going to do is for any value of t, I'm going to look at the distribution of those three edge lengths. And then a little bit later, I'm going to let t get larger. So let me think about what happens as t get lar gets larger. As t gets larger, I get many more branches over here, but t over 2 also moves over to the right. And so what these particular blue things are is going to change because I'm going to have more lineages and different sets of three edges. But I'm going to show that taking that limit as t goes off to infinity somehow I reach some common distribution that get sort of fuzzes out the details of exactly which branches uh, I'm dealing with. Because at t over 2, we will be crossing more and more, uh, more and more edges. OK, so if I let f of t be the, the distribution of these three branch lengths all combined into one distribution, 
Um, I'm going to let T go to infinity and call the distribution I get from that F infinity. And it, in, in the process of, of dealing with this, one of the things we show is that even though F of T is defined from looking at a particular tree, F infinity, this limit as you let the tree gets bigger and bigger, actually didn't depend on the tree that we started with. Any tree that was produced by this same model parameters would have produced the same F infinity. So we've got a way of extracting a probability distribution from the tree in such a way that it doesn't depend on the particular tree. It just depends on the tree being, if you like, infinitely large. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, yep. Okay. So it's not that you're thinking of taking a sequence of trees as the tree length goes to infinity. You essentially have a single infinitely deep tree. Right. And we're sort of scanning along it and see, and sort of as we scan along, we get better and better information. That's exactly right. And, you know, we saw that actually with the, the basic constant model, right? The, the, in the lineages through time plot, the, the uh, graph got closer and closer to that one line with slope lambda minus mu. So there was more information uh, when we had more lineages. And the difference is in that one, we could use the fact that all the lineages were behaving independently. Here, we can't. They are not behaving independently. So two um, edges that are close to one another in the tree are going to be more likely to be in the same type, and therefore they are not going to be independent of one another. But this asymptotic distribution F infinity sort of deals with that in a nice way to get over the non-independence. And I just had to remind myself that like, one of the key hypotheses of this proof is that you have a pure birth model. So there's no risk of the tree going extinct before. Yeah, and and, and th that, is, that is exactly right. And so for what I'm presenting here, uh, it is important that it's pure birth. And if you ask again at the end of the talk, if we have time, I can, can say more about the birth death. Great. Uh, OK. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So um, as t goes to infinity, um, the thing is that the, the, the type distribution across this blue line, actually, this was studied back in the 60s by, in a paper by Athreya. It's, it's, this is called a classical uh, multi-type branching process. And the models they were studying were not trees. It was, they called them branching processes. But what they were allowing to be observed was exactly the opposite of what we are uh, dealing with in phylogenetics. You didn't see the tree, but what you saw instead was, for any line here, the count of how many of the edges where that line crosses had each type. So you had type information, but not the tree, while we have tree information, but not the type. Um, so um, nonetheless, we were able to sort of exploit these results to say, well, these, these guys de uh, derived a distribution for the types across the blue line. And that enables us with a little bit more work to de deduce what the distribution would be for these nodes at the center of the three blue edges uh, across the tree. Okay, And then once we have that, we can reformulate this, this distribution as um, something that's a little bit complicated to say. It is a mixture model over the types, okay, because I have k types, and depending on what the type is, there is a easily understandable structure to what the length of these three edges are. Okay, those are random processes, but I can write down what the distribution should be if I knew what that type was. And so, what I have is a mixture of k independent, because if I know the type right here, these three edges around it are in fact independent now. Uh, product distributions. And uh, this is a model that has been studied in a lot of places in statistics, sometimes called a conditional independence model or a latent class model, or in classification theory, it's called the naive Bayes model, uh, if any of those words have ever come up before. Um, and uh, the, the thing about it is it really has a very simple hidden variable structure, where you, which you can think of as there's one node which could be in any of K types. 
and then conditional on what that type is, we have three measurements of branch lengths, of three independent branch lengths. And um, there's a theorem about this that I was involved in about 10 years ago, and also Elizabeth Allman was involved in, Catherine Matias is our, is our third collaborator, that says these models with K classes, again, it's important that they, this be a finite number, and three observed continuous variables have identifiable parameters if certain technical conditions are met. So looking and, and working backwards, this is why we, we chose to look at F infinity. We knew that it would be the sort of thing we could apply this, this model to. So if, if you want the, the key insight, it's that you know, what we should do is look at three edge links around the node because that should fit one of these conditional continue uh, conditional independence models, and then it was just a matter of overcoming the technicalities of how do we really get a distribution that is exactly uh, of the framework for applying this theorem, and then that theorem tells us that we have identifiable parameters. Um, the rest of the proof is is actually just a, a lot of. Uh, rather complicated busy work. We apply the previous theorem. That gives us information on edge length distributions conditioned on a node type, uh, whether we're in the fast or slow speciating type. And then um, it also gives us information on the percentage of nodes that are of each class, even though we could uh, observe of each type, uh, even though the types are never observable. It's This is the key to getting type information even though the data itself doesn't directly give it to you okay and then that you can be used to get identify certain functions of these parameters and then it's uh, a lot of long but straightforward arguments to actually get the parameters out okay so uh i'll give some final comments um so big type comb is the parameters of a pure birth sse model and by this i mean ones with a finite number of types. So not the quasi one, but the, the, the ones that are usually used or more widespread in use are identifiable from a single large tree. Okay, that was incredibly informally stated. So just to be a little bit more mathematically accurate, they're only generically identifiable. There are exceptions, but not ones you should necessarily worry about unless you have a data analysis that turns out to be really strange. Um, uh, from the tree as the depth goes to infinity. So just underscoring the fact that I think we sh all should have known anyway. In applying this to do inference, you want to have as big a tree as you can possibly get because that's where you get more information. Okay. Um, a nice thing about the, 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 uh, the theorem is that having observations of trait types at the leaves is not needed at all. Um, this is important uh, since the trait observations that you do get at the leaves are, to my mind, at best something you're hypothesizing match up with the model ones, but you don't really know that. And uh, this seems like a, an ad for Missy from the last talk. I will say when we were proving this, we didn't know about Missy. Uh, we didn't know that that's the way the sort of more applied work was going, but it's something that I wholeheartedly endorse. Um, the Eric briefly asked about the, the birth death is issue. Um, I strongly suspect the proof will extend to that. I have some ideas of how it should go, um, but it's a bit more complicated. And uh, as a mathematician, my nature rebels a bit against saying, I suspect it will work. Um, I can't give you a probability that it will work. Um, there are often unforeseen technical complications, but I think we understand well enough the framework that should be applied and there's no reason to be worried at this point that there will be problems. And e even though I uh, tried to say earlier, there's no theorem that says when you do maximum likelihood with this model that is identifiable in the sense that I've given from one tree that it will actually give you statistically consistent inference. I don't think that that is likely to be false. I think it, it will be statistically consistent, but it is not a standard thing. Um, 
there's there's proofs of this for hidden Markov models that are quite elaborate to deal with the fact that if you do maximum likelihood from one sequence of observations that where the sequence is getting longer and longer, that is different from doing it from many independent sequences of observations. Okay, so those are all the positives, I think. Um, and then some things that I want to point out that this does not address that have come up when I've talked to other people is this doesn't say anything about how to choose the number of types when you're using one of these multi-type models. And in fact, that is not a question for inference because you change the number of types, you change the number of models. You've got a bigger model than you had before if you up the number of types. And how you deal with that is model selection, not inference. Um, and, and it's just, it's not even the right question to ask if you can infer the number of types. Um, it also doesn't say anything about reconstruction of ancestral trait types along the tree. That was briefly mentioned in the last talk. Um, and uh, that, in fact, I think one of the things that I've understood better as we go through this is that information about the, the trait type is actually something that's local in the tree. If you're interested in the trait type at a particular point, that information is lost as you move away from that point in the tree because you may speciate into other, I mean, you, sorry, may, may uh, switch into different types. And so as, as you move away from there, the information just gets weaker and weaker. So even if you have an enormous tree, that's not giving you more information most of the time about one particular place in the tree. So there's there's really, I think, a limit to the quality of uh, ancestral uh, trait type reconstruction. Um, and it all, this also doesn't say anything about the right framework for testing whether an observed trait correlates or determines or whatever with the changing speciation and extinction rates. I think. The, uh, that was discussed a lot in the last talk, and I think they did an, an excellent job of that. Um, it, but I do want to say one more time that if you have an observed trait and you're using one of these models, you do not know that that trait actually matches the one that's causing the speciation and extinction. And the right way to test whether it is, is not clear. Okay, and I will end with some references. The first one is the paper that this was talking about, which has already appeared in January, and the other two are the main uh, sort of more technical results that uh, that it depended on. Awesome, okay. thank you. That that was a that like yeah, that was a wonderfully clear talk. I uh, I was really surprised to see that basically it came down to this like identifiability of mute mixture models thing that you probably were coming up from a com for a completely different reason. Yeah, yeah well, I, 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 let me make a little comment about that because th this paper is mildly amusing to me anyway, that we, we uh, Elizabeth Allman and I had been working with uh, identifiability of a lot of phylogenetic models before and knew that the basis that this paper builds on, this, this theorem from Kruskal in 1977 was really powerful. We met our other collaborator who did lots of other kind of work, and she recognized, hey, you should be able to apply this idea to some other statistical models. And in some ways, I think of this whole paper was sort of technology transfer from some insights that we had, had gotten through looking at phylogenetic models where hidden variables are all over the place and saying, look, this is how it can be applied to many, many different statistical models. And I never really expected that we were going to take one of the results of it and, and apply it back into phylogenetics. But um, the, the, this paper does not deal with phylogenetics, but it is, if I had to say where are the, the ideas from it coming from, they're all really from phylogenetics. So, Cool. Well, we, um, we should wrap uh, not too long, but Jonathan Terhorst does have a great question. Um, it is namely, showed this, I mean, you have this polynomial, and this is sort of like the bad place you don't want to be. And he asked, basically, if you're close to that polynomial, um, be, yeah. is it bad? Is, does your estimation go off the rails? I think so, OK? I, I think that is exactly the way to look at it. In practice, you want your 
you would like the parameters you're trying to infer not being close to that. Um, if they are close to that, you are likely to need much more data to be able to infer them correctly. Um, yeah. If I understand correctly, there's no, I mean, there's no sense in which you can say something about the amount of data that is really required. I mean, this is and, uh, Yeah, those are hard questions, right, in, in general and in statistics of how much data yeah. do you need to be able to infer something. But I think it would mean, you know, if, if you are near those bad points, you will need more data. And if you don't have enough data, then you know you can look for a more detailed analysis of the nature of those bad points and sometimes you can get get them okay we we haven't tried for this it may be that like that whole curve is collapsed to so anything on that curve any set of parameters on that curves gives you exactly the same uh uh behavior of the model but not necessarily it could be that that curve is simply folded over you know, there's lots of different way things ways things could go wrong with that. Cool. Yeah, but but that polynomial, I will say, is explicit. So so one could, after inferring parameters, could write down that pol polynomial, plug the the parameters in, and see if am I really close to this non-identifiable region or not. Um, and you know, should I worry about this issue? In theory, you could do that. I'd I'd don't know how, how useful that would be in practice. And I, I, I haven't seen any other questions, so I get to ask. Like, <laughs> I really should go. I'm, I'm actually late for another meeting, but um, they'll forgive me. I, like, so this polynomial just falls out of some tensor algebra, basically. That's sort of like, I mean, how should we think about it? Like, it's a semantic uh, section okay. of well, there some... You go. <laughs> Okay. I, I had this, I, I figured you were going to ask this. Okay. So where does it come from? What does it say? Okay. So here's the math answer. Ignore this if you're not a mathematician. So it's essentially a Vronskyan determinant not being zero. And it ensures that certain functions arising in the analysis are linearly independent. Okay. And that was needed for that uh, conditional independence model result. We need the functions to be linearly independent. And, uh, and so that's really what it's saying. Now, that's not particularly helpful, I think, um, other than saying, yeah, there could be a serious problem if it were zero. But here's some explicit examples again. If k is equal to 2, I didn't show this because it's too easy. That polynomial turns out to be lambda 1 minus lambda 2. Okay, so what is this it not being zero saying? It's just saying you have two different speciation rates, which we're already assuming anyway. So for k equal to, no issue whatsoever. The conditions are ones that people wouldn't be worried about. For k equal 3, this is the polynomial I assume I uh, wrote down before. I can specialize this in certain ways. So for instance, if all the switching rates were equal, and that's what's done in the implementation of MISI, even though it's really not necessary, I just set all the uh, SIJs equal to the same S, and I simplify this, and then something factors and goes away. And it turns out that this whole polynomial becomes this. So it, there it is in factored forms. And what it's, this is saying is that uh, lambda 1 cannot be equal to lambda 2, because if it were, that would make this product be 0. Lambda 1 also can't be equal to lambda 3, and lambda 2 can't be equal to lambda 3. So again, that's saying simply all the lambdas have to be distinct. And we already assumed that as well. So if you're willing to say, I want all my switching parameters to be the same, then you can realize explicitly what this condition is, and it's not something you're likely to worry about. There's a little bit more trouble if you don't assume these are all the same. And I've done some other special cases, like two of them are the same, and then that forces them to have, you know, different uh, certain conditions on the, the uh, speciation rates. But all of them, if I make some specialization, which I think is a reasonable one, and then try to interpret what this says, what comes out is something plausible and not, you know, something that you would say, oh yeah, that's not a, a bad thing to assume at all. However, for the full generality of this polynomial, I have zero good interpretation of it. Awesome. I love it.
Okay. Well, um, thanks again, and uh, thanks everyone for your patience as we sort of sorted through some of the technical yeah, my stuff. My apologies for that too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, beautiful talk. Great way to end this, and I look forward to hearing. And hopefully, we'll get a positive result for birth death models um, in a year or two. Possibly, we'll see. Yeah. yeah right. I, I love how you really. Going on. Yep. <laughs> I love how you were clear that like uh, you were not making a probability statement. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, good.